All right, I think we can get started. Okay. Um, so thank you for joining us for today's Lunchtime Art Talk, um, which as many of you know, is a weekly series led by Hammer Curators on works from our collection. Um, in this iteration, the series will focus on artists featured in Made in LA, a version, Melody 2020, a version. Um, free reservations to visit our biennial at the Hammer are now available. So please visit our website to reserve your time. Um, for those who aren't familiar, my name is Ike Chukonyuwegni. I'm a curatorial assistant here at the Hammer. Um, and for the biennial, I was an assistant curator of performance, um, um, supporting my dear colleagues and co-curators, Lauren, Benz Lauren Mackler and Miriam Benzala. And today I'll be facilitating this lunchtime up talk, which will be focusing on Justin Leroy's project, Sun. Um, and then after the presentation, I'll be able to answer all your questions. Um, a few Zoom tidbits. Um, before we begin, uh, when the presentation starts, please select speaker view um, in the top right corner of your screen and in the middle of your screen, click on view options to ensure side by side. Um, to ensure side by side and fit to window are checked. Um, please also note today's program is being recorded that you have the option to toggle your camera on and off using the camera icon in the bottom left corner. Uh, so please do whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, you will remain on mute until the end of the presentation, at which point I will unmute those who have questions. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions or for me or any technical issues, you can drop it into the chat feature and someone from the Hammer will kind of take care of you. Um, Okay, Keen, um, shout out to Keen today. He's gonna to be helping with the slides. Um, right, first slide. So, so today I'll be talking about Justin and Justin was one of the first cultural workers I met in LA that I could sense had a clear vision. Um, you know, when we spoke, um, there was an intensity that was kind of overlaid or with care, tenderness and curiosity. Um, we met at the Underground Museum and we kept in touch uh, discussing the evolution of sun, possible points of collaboration, seen as sun is a multifaceted project that focuses on you know, black masculinity and the expression of it. Um, I was drawn to the possibility of, you know, I was talking to Justin about convening black men to chat about life, emotions, et cetera. Um, some of you may know I was a therapist in my past life. And uh, before I left the practice I used to work out of, um, and I was putting together some ideas for anger management workshops for black men based on what I was noticing in my individual classes. Um, and uh, I think for me, that was something that I was thinking about proposing to Justin. And, you know, I think I've mentioned it briefly about getting men together, but something about, you know, sitting with Justin and just chat with him. I knew there was a strong vision here um, and something that just, he gravitates, people gravitate towards him given that those visions. Um, I also sat with Justin and was a part of some barbershop themed photos that he took. Um, I think out of one of the spaces and ciliary spaces for the underground museum, you know, we came, I came through and um, I believe I may have been featured in the first iteration of Sun, which was a photo exhibition. Um, and then since then it kind of blossomed into what it is now, this kind of like multimedia, multi-dimensional kind of platform. Um, Justin also had a show on NTS radio, a Sun radio show um, that's worth listening to. And I think for us, Lauren, Miriam and myself, that was the impetus behind our early conversations and what his contribution to Made in LA 2020 would be. You know, um, to be clear, Sun's contribution to the biannual is a suite of podcasts. Um, so it's kind of building off of the show on NTS. Um, that one could conceivably listen to from the hammer to the Huntington or vice versa. So again, something that we've talked about in some of these lunchtime art talks is this space in between. And I think Justin's project was something that we envisioned. Um, and you can also think about how you can listen to the project at any time and it shifts the exhibition out of physical space. Um, 
But I think I want to reference Justin's words specifically in terms of why he began Sun. And I think that's super important. Um, so my work derives from my own personal needs. I ask myself, what kind of world do I want to live in? What kind of conversations do I wish to be a part of? What do I want to hear? I'm looking to uplift myself. When creating Sun, I was personally seeking a space where I could be vulnerable and collaborative with men that looked like me. Spaces for black men have been difficult for me to navigate, but I knew I couldn't be the only one. The challenge to perform as hyper-masculine and without any emotional intuition had presented itself to me at five years old, and I've never felt aligned with its demands. Even when trying, I couldn't survive. In my development, I began to see how expectations of this performance exhausted the men around me, as well as the relationships, their relationships and worldviews. I felt called to research, open my world, and to bring some ease to this paradigm. Um, next slide. So I want to sit with this idea of space or world building as a way to survive. And in talking about this, you know, it would be remiss not to note the work of Henri Lefab and Doreen Massey, who stated, you know, space, this is what ensures survival of being. And for me, I was drawn to Sun for this desire to meditate on what survival looks like, um, what being looks like, but also how that meditation is deeply entrenched in the history of the barbershop. Um, so Sun's podcast, recordings, programming, it's all tied to a space um, touched by an angel. So he operates out of this space called Touched by an Angel, which is Justin's father's long-standing barbershop in South Central LA. And the reason I have these two books up here is because these books build on this meditation of the barbershop as a space for survival or at a push, this uh, idea of the hush harbor. And um, in Voris Nunley's book, we learn broadly speaking that the hush harbors were secretive spaces that allowed enslaved people, enslaved black people to explore literature and faith-based practices. Um, Nunley cites um, a slave from North Carolina, uh, her name was Charity Bowery, and how the hush harbor was tied to the quest for literacy. In, in quote, I have seen Negroes up in the country going away under large oaks and in secret places, sitting in the woods with spelling books. Um, relatedly, hush harbors were necessary because as poet and professor Melville Boyd points out, slaves could be beaten, even killed for having a spelling book, um, for having a spelling book, for trying to read as such. Rebellious rhetorical spaces was linked to intellectual freedom and by extension, um, physical freedom. So from this, if you've been in a barbershop, you know it's a space where banter, politics, ideas, and the like happen. And there's an element of that that's bound up in the hush harbor as a concept. But I think these spaces feel very hyper-masculine as Justin noted. So I think that's where the power of sun and the programming shines through. Um, another point I wanna stress is the lineage of the barbershop as an abolitionist space. Um, but it also held tension in doing so. Um, next slide, please. Um, there were segregated spaces in that, you know, during the antebellum era and during reconstruction, um, the black barbershop only catered to white men. So it was like prohibited for black men to cut other black men's hair and to make profit from it. So there were limits on how black men related to other black men um, and white slave owners would often hire out their black barbers to cut um, white folks here in the town. So this space in a way was like prohibitive of homosocial bonding between black men, which I think is key to thinking about sun and it's kind of like what it's doing. Um, but it also provided this unfiltered access to information that fueled abolitionist sentiment. So the barbershop kind of lives in the body and moves through varied spaces, much like the itinerant nature of the hush harbor. And, you know, oddly enough, you know, white men freely spoke paradoxically, but it was weird because they surprisingly did not think the black barbers could kind of like convey what they were speaking about to the community. So it, it's almost as if they saw the black barber as just this laboring entity and not a sentient being that could listen and relay information. But who, what you're seeing up on the screen is John Vashon. Um, he was a barber and he reminds me of Justin, his father. Um, Vashon um, had a barber shop um, in Pittsburgh. Um, and what was interesting is he, he had the barbershop and then he expanded out to set up Pittsburgh's first public bathhouse. 
called City Baths, and it was on Third Street between Market and Ferry Street to downtown. Um, but in addition, I think his barbershop activities was kind of like the hub, similar to Sun and Touched by an Angel. Um, in 1983, Vashon organized the Pittsburgh Anti-Slavery Society, uh, which was the first organization of its kind in the area. And, you know, while Sun doesn't recognize, I don't, I don't think Sun is a space explicitly focused on anti-slavery as an institution, but the program is tied intimately to pushing against anti-Black society as it impacts Black men. And I think related to how Justin thinks about Sun as a hub of kind of like fueling ideas and so forth, Vashon also saw his barbershop and his work as pushing the importance of education. Um, lack of knowledge for Vashon was like a threat, was a threat to freedom. And in 1832, he actually gathered black residents to form the Pittsburgh African Education Society to establish a small school. Um, another barbershop, uh, another barber just to mention, Alfred Niger, he was based out of Providence and he started in 1841, the Rhode Island Anti-Slavery Society. So you can see in the 19th century, the barbers were focused on abolitionist work. Um, Vashon, for instance, financed and supported and distributed William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator newspaper, um, so a white abolitionist newspaper. Um, and I think what's also interesting is 19th century abolitionist focus, but also 20th century. And again, speaking to the attention, you can see the black barber was, barbershop was fueling specific rigid ideas of what black masculinity and aesthetics should look like. Um, next slide, please. Now, I also want to think about how Sun exists in a multifaceted way in the exhibition of Made in LA. You know, the hub of Sun, the barbershop touched by an angel, is also a site for Khalil's Joseph's Black News that I talked about some weeks back. Um, and I think, you know, Black News in many ways is a continuation of Black TV programming that blossomed during the post-civil rights era, since I think we're still advocating for civil rights uh, today. Um, but Justin is a music director at Black News and the alignment of Sun with Black News almost invites the consideration of um, the barbershop as a public, Black public square. Um, and interestingly enough, William Greaves, who was the executive producer of Black Journal um, from 1968 to 1970, likened Black TV programming platforms as a type of communal space um, or similar to the Black barbershop. And, you can see here, I'll read the quote, we were aware that we had to develop programming that communicated to the black community. And one of the paradigms or one of the devices that I used in developing monthly programs was the black barbershop. You know, the kinds of things that, routinely discussed, that are routinely discussed in a black barbershop. I used to filter these concepts through a black barbershop in my own head. Um, next slide. And here you can see images of Black News installed um, in uh, Touched by an Angel. Um, next slide. Again, Black News is Khalil Joseph's project um, and it's a two channel um, kind of like fugitive news broadcast um, that is uh, located throughout Los Angeles in, in various neighborhoods throughout South Central. Uh, next slide. And again, this is an interesting kind of like juxtaposition. Um, for example, if you're conceivably looking and getting your hair cut and looking at yourself in the barber chair into the window, you can almost watch Black News. So whether you're getting your hair cut or you're waiting for your child or significant other to get their hair cut, you can always kind of like take in the content. So it's, I think it's really interesting consideration of aesthetics and arrangement and so forth. Next slide. Um, next slide. So just giving you visuals of what it looks like in the space. Uh, next slide. Um, and I wanted to kind of like touch on this poem. It's a really beautiful poem. The Barbershop is a Ritual. And I think this, it's by Sharon Strange. Um, and I think it dovetails with um, this idea of the Hush Harbor, this idea of the spiritual practices that come out of the Barbershop. Um, I won't read the whole thing. And if, I think if you're interested in it, um, I can make it available. Um, but I think what's interesting is like the last passage where it talks about head bowed, church solemn. He sheds hair like mother love and virginity. 
weightier than Air Jordans and designer sweats, euphemistic battle gear. He received the tribal standard, a nappy helmet, sporting arrows, lightning bolts, rows of lines cut in New World. Um, I can go on, but I think what's interesting about that last stanza is kind of like thinking about, you know, the tensions around Black masculinity, how it's performed, how it kind of like shows up in one's spiritual practice, um, but also how it's also in concert with, um, you know, femininity, motherhood, um, different types of um, presentations of Black self that I think it says warrior than Ed Jordans and designer. And that's not to knock Ed Jordans and designer um, sweats and so forth, but it's thinking about how there's a, a polyvalent way in which blackness can show up, which I think is very critical to what Justin is doing with Sun. Uh, next slide. But I want to close with Justin's first podcast that is available. And I think I encourage you to listen to it if you haven't already. It's like a 30 minute or 20 minute um, clip. Um, and I think it was rather novel how Justin approached the podcast, given the limitations of COVID. You know, initially we were thinking about his radio show on NTS, but you know, Justin took time with it and just flipped the script. And, you know, since he couldn't gather people to come together, you know, the voice notes of care that Justin's friends and community shared with him, he spliced that together into this kind of like, kind of like sonic assemblage um, with a score produced with Sloss and Malone. And it produced this really ecstatic experience. The first episode is called On God, which is fitting. Um, and in the promotional video that Justin made to launch the podcast, it kind of blew me away in the way you're seeing this video of someone driving down um, a dark road. Um, it's like winding down this kind of like sable darkened road. And it invokes this idea of faith, given its title, but also given the way you think about faith, how it steers you. Um, and I'm thinking about like the late theologian, Paul Tillich. He saw faith as something as a, a state of being ultimately concerned, be it with one's success, salvation, or safety. And I think when you think about these three things, you know, Justin's mastery of sound, of community building, world building, and healing and so forth is so assuring that, you know, you felt safe as you're watching this promotional video and, and who's behind the wheel. And the project is called Leave a Message. And what Justin has done is folks can call a number and, you know, he says, you know, leave a message, you know, Leroy. And um, you can leave a message and these fragments will get worked into future iterations of the podcast. Um, but for his first podcast, you know, Justin kind of weaves these voice messages and it dwells in this kind of like nebulous space of faith. You think about faith as this orientation towards the future, but I think what's really beautiful and poetic about these words is how faith is also thinking about the here and now with folks sending notes about how they're dealing with the pandemic, but also how faith is also a meditation on the past. Um, and I wanna focus on a particular segment. Um, Keen, if you can play this section of the podcast. Um, but I, I, I wanted to um, film her and, and talk about her relationship to the dark um, because it really informed my relationship to the dark growing up as a child. Um, she was someone who pretty much was invested in a sort of kind of spirituality that um, wrestled with demons, wrestled with ghosts, wrestled with all of the sort of things that the bad things that you that could happen um and i picked up a lot of that from her and usually that's why i would sleep with her like when I'm growing up because i was so deeply afraid of the dark because of all of the things that she had told me about it um and it's where my imagination went wild just as much as her imagination went wild and so we shared that in common in terms of like our relationship to the dark, but um, we also mind the dark and I think. So that was my dear friend, Shai Keef, is a photographer, installation artist, really amazing person and artist, definitely check out his work. Um, 
But Sharkeef there in that segment is talking about his relationship to darkness with his grandmother. Um, and I think it reminds me of this Bell Hooks riveting essay from 1995 called An Aesthetics of Blackness, Strange and Oppositional. And I think those two descriptors are really relevant. Um, I want to highlight parts of that essay because I think it relates to San and also Shaikif's relationship with his grandmother. So in a passage, Bell Hooks notes, making and listening to Black music, both secular and sacred, was one of the ways Black folks developed an aesthetic. Celebration of popular forms ensured their survival, kept them as a legacy to be passed on, even as they were altered and transformed by the interplay of varied cultural forces. And I think thinking about how Sun, the podcast, and Justin's ultimate project evolved kind of speaks to this element of survival. How do you kind of change your art form? And then I think towards the end of the essay, Bell Hooks kind of closes beautifully. She says, after reading the essay on aesthetics in praise of shadows, I tell this sister in a late night conversation that I'm learning to think about blackness in a new way. Tanizaki in the essay speaks of seeing beauty in darkness and shares this moment of insight. Quote, the quality that we call beauty, however, must always grow from the realities of life and our ancestors forced to live in dark rooms, presently came to discover beauty in shadows, ultimately to guide shadows towards beauty's end. My sister has skin darker than mine. We think about our skin as a dark room, a place of shadows. We talk often about color politics and the ways racism has created an aesthetic that wounds us, a way of thinking about beauty that hurts us. In the shadows of late night, we talk about the need to see darkness differently, to talk about it in a new way. In that space of shadows, we long for an aesthetic blackness, strange and oppositional. Um, and I think that's just a really poetic and potent way to end, to think about what son leave a message justin is producing through this body of work and i think what to look out for in the forthcoming podcasts um i think there are three more that will drop over the run of the show um so yeah if you have questions let me know i am here i see Someone asked, will there be a new episode added before the close? Yes, there will be. So I think Justin is working on dropping a new one. I've given it a listen. It's, it's very good. It's very, um, it, I think, again, he kind of like rides tensions in a very beautiful, caring way. And um, this next one is no different. I think it. Uh, I'll give a bit of a teaser, but it talks a bit about um, the pandemic, vaccine, the history of vaccines. And it, for me, when I listened to it, it kind of reminded me of, you know, this essay by Chile and Bembe called Necropolitics and how, you know, you can think about some hesitation around, you know, the vaccine um, in relation to, you know, just the history of pharmaceutical warfare, especially if I'm from Nigeria. And, you know, Pfizer had a very kind of like thorny history in the early 1990s. So listening to the podcast, you know, reflecting on the state of things, um, you know, it gets you thinking about, you know, your own personal relationship to, you know, what's going on and the complicated ways to think about, you know. You know, I think Mbembe talks about like, petrochemical warfare or just chemical warfare and how it's like warfare is no longer like a hit and run thing it's enduring you know um that being said i'm not like get vaccinated or whatever whatever you feel comfortable with. <laughs> i just want to say that <laughs> i think it's just he's just stoking debate which is good you know uh someone asked would you say sun is a kind of way for BIPOC men to lean into their emotional intelligence? You talked about, about mental health during your presentation. Yeah, I think, um, you know, right now, I'm not sure what Justin has up his sleeves in terms of uh, um, programming. And I know with the pandemic, things have shifted, but, you know, he had ideas around like, yeah, gatherings, book clubs, you know, spaces of conversation, running clubs. There's like a physical component to this element of mental health 
that is kind of like all kind of tied together, which I love because, you know, I'm part of a run club in Koreatown. Um, so, yeah, I think he's thinking about a very holistic approach to mental health and so forth. Um, Megan Steinem, shout out to you. How has working with Justin on Sun and Black News affected, changed, uplift how you think about collaboration? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think for me, it's patience. And yeah, I think patience is probably, and just letting people just do their, do their thing. You know, I think having faith, <laughs> interesting enough, having faith in the process, you know, I think Justin, the episode of On God and talking about how faith is this, um, how faith is this kind of like idea of being ultimately concerned. I think you can be concerned about something, a collaboration without being um, paternalistic or micromanaging. And I think one thing that has, I've learned is also trust in the process. Like I think when the pandemic hit and you know, Justin was like in the throes of figuring out how to record this podcast, you know, there would be weeks that we wouldn't hear from him. And I think, you can panic, but knowing Justin and his brilliance, like, and similarly Khalil and Black News, you know, we know that they're going to deliver. And I think even bringing it to Black News and how Khalil's idea of like news is always shifting, always relevant, uh, always uncertain and depending on what is new to you. Um, so questioning the authority of what is news through presenting, you know, through by presenting new information or context or you know, ideas, I think, again, there's this patience with oneself, with the process, with the outcome, and also with not even like resting on, you know, the end product. Because I think, you know, after Black New, after Sun finishes, you know, with the various podcasts, it'll, the project will live on in perpetuity. You can listen to the podcast, but then Sun is going to go on and, continue to do programming and so forth. So I think it's uh, the patience and the question of authority, you know, supersedes, you know, the museum and the exhibition as a context, you know, I think, cause black news and sun will keep on going long after Made in LA closes. And I think that's the beauty of, you know, when something is collaborative and community based, you know, it's it, it has wings and legs to kind of like keep pushing. So, yeah, I think collaboration is patience, trust in the process, and just, yeah. Any more questions? Thanks for that question, Megan. Yes, more patience and trust, yes. Yes, we need that. I think we are good. So yeah, definitely, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever, wherever you listen to podcasts, check out Sun. I think the barbershop is open. Sorry, I'm pointing. My bad. I think the barbershop is open. So, yeah, you know, if you're in South Central, swing by, you know, and get a haircut. I clearly need a haircut, but, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for coming. Um, hold on, I have some closing stuff to talk about. Um, So I think that's all we have time for questions. Um, thank you again for joining us for this afternoon and special thanks to Bank of America for presenting Made in LA 2020, a version. To support programs like this and future programs, we invite you to become a Hammer member or donate to the museum by visiting us at hammer.ucla.edu forward slash support. Um, and be sure to join us next week um, for the Lunchtime Art Talk. Made in LA 2020 co-curator Lauren Mackler will lead a presentation on the work of Jeffrey Stuka. So definitely come through, check it out. Um, and thank you very much for coming.